Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I wanted to sing a quick hymn and then we're going to get into the title. This is uh, How to Start Your Morning and the key to witnessing. There's two things that I wanted to talk with you about today and encourage you brothers and sisters in Christ. But before we get started, I thought I'd sing a hymn and I'm going to sing the hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. First, I pray that all is well with the brethren, that you're staying in God's Word, you're staying in prayer, you're living a life of Christ, and that you're praying for one another, and that you're loving one another. Basically, you're living for Jesus Christ, always having your eyes on that blessed hope, which we're going to get into a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. So, uh, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there with a deep contrite spirit, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face. Heal my wounded broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Whilst on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. I love the part here where it says, save me by thy grace. It's God's grace that saves. It's God that does the saving. So, brothers and Christ, part of this is we're talking about, we're going to be talking about how to start your day. Brothers and Christ, make sure you can get yourself your own little pamphlet. Uh, there's a book over there, Brother in Christ got me, oh, it's right here. Sorry. Got me a good hymn book. And if you look in there, I've been saving all these spots when I fellowship with some of the brethren and sing some hymns with some of the brethren. Uh, good hymn book. Uh, I, I printed out some hymns and put them in here. And make sure you're singing some hymns every once in a while, Brothers Just Christ. It's good for you. It's good for you. So, we're going to get into this. How to start your day. Right? Now, Brothers Just Christ, I keep pushing this, and I've talked about it in studies, and I'm seeing that it's something that needs to be talked about again. Because I keep hitting up the brethren. Did you start your day with the Word of God and prayer? Did you start your day with the Word of God? Okay. Uh, King David says in the Psalms that he... Uh, God, thy servant loveth thy laws, and he meditates on them on night and day. I'm still trying to memorize some of the scriptures. But he talked about meditating on God's laws night and day. Where do you find God's laws? In His Word. So it's meditating on the Word of God night and day. Okay. God's Word, what He says we're supposed to do, what He says is right, what He says is wrong. We're supposed to make it night and day. So I've always pushed this, brothers and Christ, that you start your day with the Word of God in prayer, and that you end your day with the Word of God in prayer. 
And I've noticed when I talk to some of the brethren that some are, you know, kind of slacking on this and they're kind of putting it off and they're not always starting their day with the Word of God and prayer and they're not always ending the day with the Word of God and prayer. And they're starting to struggle. They're starting to struggle with the, like to the point of giving in to the flesh, the lust of the flesh, making provisions for the lust of the flesh. Remember the Bible says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Okay. They're, they're struggling with the world, dealing with the world. They could be doing nothing wrong, but it's the, the, the stress of dealing with the wicked world and having to deal with lost neighbors, having to deal with lost family members. When you go to a job that's full of lost people and, you know, going out in public and being vexed by the wickedness of the world, some of the brethren are having a hard time dealing with it. And when you sit down and talk with them, I'm realizing they're not starting their day with the Word of God. And ending their day with the Word of God. Now, I want to say this, Brother Jesus Christ, that when I started, when I was newly saved, a babe in Christ, when I first started, it became, it's, it's, it, you have to get into a habit. Having a Bible, sitting by your bed, you start your day with the Word of God, you end your day with the Word of God. Okay? And when I started, it was simply forcing myself to read. You had to force yourself to read the, the book, the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures? Yes, I did. Because that's how you get yourself into um, a good habit. When I was first saved, um, this is where I'm at like in my uh, morning and evening uh, reads. So, Ephesians chapter 6, the last Ephesians, we're going to start at uh, verse 10. This is how I had to do it. I had to open the book and I had to force myself to read. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. And you keep reading. And by the time you get through this, you're like, well, I, I, don't, I don't get a lot of it. Sometimes there's parts where you read through and you don't get any of it. And you're like, well, why would you read it if you don't get it? Because the Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally and breath not, and it shall be given to him. And Paul talks about being a babe in Christ versus being someone who's a mature Christian. When I was a babe in Christ, I didn't know a lot about this book. I knew about the true plan of salvation. I went through the Bible version issue, which we're going to talk about a little bit. And I did a lot of those studies. I listened to some good studies. But when it came to my memory, I didn't know about this when it came to memory. I didn't know a lot about this book when it came to memorizing verses and remembering verses. And so I had to force myself to read it. And the first time you read it, you're just telling yourself, read it. You might not get it, but you need to read it. And that's what I'm trying to push for the brethren. If you're a babe in Christ, you need to be starting the day with the word and prayer. You start by praying, saying, Lord, you know, open the scriptures to me. Help me to learn something from what I'm about to read. Help me to apply it to my heart, O oh Lord, and bless this day, Lord, and watch over this day. This is what I'd like to get done today, Lord, but not my will, but thy will be done. Okay? And you talk with the Lord, and then you open up and you talk to the Lord as you read the Bible. When I first started, I just read. I read the, let's say I read the whole chapter of Ephesians chapter 6. I read the whole chapter, and I was like this, and I put it down. And I could get it done in like five minutes. Five minutes, read the whole chapter, done, put the book down, get up, start my day. That's how I was as a babe in Christ. Now as you get to studying the Word of God, you watch some good studies, and you start going around, I start highlighting. You know, you can get into highlighting. I don't know if it's, uh, highlighting or underlining. Some people underline and, and make notes and stuff like that. But you really get into solid studies following 2 Timothy 2.15. So then, when you get to where you're a mature Christian, you might not be there yet. You've got to start out with just simply reading it. And to not to go off on too much of a tangent, but I've been ta I was talking to a brother in Christ recently, and I was like, with me, when you start becoming a mature Christian, and you've studied the, the doctrines that are for today, you study the instruction in righteousness, you go through and learn the different stories, like the, the history of the whole world, from Genesis to Revelation, and you start studying some of these things, you get to a point in your life where well, why, you already know it, so why keep reading it? And I said, because it's called maintenance. Okay? Maintenance. 
if I put this book down, I'll start to forget things. I know of some brethren that start turning their backs on the, the real doctrines, the doctrines that are for today, some of the instruction in righteousness, they start turning their back on this book. Not because their whole attitude is, is, I want to turn my back on this book. They don't go into it thinking that, I want to turn my back. They start forgetting things because they put this book down. we got to keep our, all the doctrines, all the teachings, the Word of God fresh in our heart. we got to stay in this book daily. And that's my encouragement to the brother, that you stay in the book daily. But then when you start getting in, to like start memorizing some scriptures, you start you know, learning, God starts opening, okay, this is what I know what this means, this is what this means, that what this means. The next time you come across this, let's say you, uh, 10 years, I'll use me as, a, as an example. 10 years of being saved. When I was first saved, I, had to, I, didn't, I didn't start my day with this book. I'll be honest with you, when I first got stay, saved, I didn't start my day with the Word of God. I always told myself, I'll do it. No, nah, I, I could do it. You know, oh, I forgot. No, it's not a big deal. I had to get to a point that if I forgot to start my day with the Word of God, when I remembered, I needed to stop what I was doing and, and read a few, few verses. Find the Bible, open it up, read a little bit, and then say, okay, and make it a big deal of saying that I have to get into the Word of God every day. Every day. Now, when I read the book, this is how, how I read It's more like I'm doing a mini Bible study with the Lord. And I talk with the Lord about it. And this is what you'll get to when you get, you know, you've been saved for a while. You stay in the Word of God. You stay in prayer. You stay in the good Bible studies. And you start reading this. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Strong in the Lord. That reminds me of that verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Well, how do you be strong in the Lord? Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I remember over there, it talked about, I think it's Romans, where it talked about the armor of light, putting on the whole armor of light. And if you're putting on the armor of light, you're putting on Jesus Christ. And I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. In verse 12, he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I keep reminding myself, and talking with the Lord, Brother Jesus Christ, I remind myself, talking with the Lord, I said, Lord, help me. There's times where I get distracted by what's going on in the world. Where the world's fighting over each other for power, money, lust of the flesh, worldliness, control, you know. And... I have nothing to do with what's going on in the world as a whole. What I have to do with is this my walk with the Lord, and when I come across people, when I'm trying to witness for Jesus Christ, or I come across people who profess to be brethren, you know, profess to be Christians, I'm one of you. And I realize, hey, there's a different spirit there. That's what we're supposed to be fighting, that different spirit, and say, hey, you're, you're not saved, get out. You're not welcome in our fellowship. Or, hey, brother, I see that you're falling away a little bit and you're getting into the world and the lusts of the flesh and worldliness. Okay? Or when we're trying to witness and we can tell... I had to learn this the hard way. You can tell who wants the truth and who doesn't want the truth. Okay? When someone doesn't want the truth, okay, I'm done with you. I want to go over here to somebody who does want the truth. When someone comes along and says, hey, I can help you, when they're actually trying to hinder you with witnessing. They're trying to hinder your walk with... That's our, we're, our battle is against this wicked body of flesh. My number one enemy is myself. I'm talking about the flesh. The Bible, Paul, if you get in there, it says Paul talks about how the body and the soul war with one another. And I'm talking this whole time, brothers, I'm talking to the Lord about this stuff. My soul, I, I talk talking about uh, my struggles with the flesh and how I fail sometimes. Uh, you talk with the Lord about these things. 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins guard about tr truth. When I first read it, I was like, oh, the loins guard about, oh, it's got to be just the, you know, the sword. You know, put that sword on, that's, that's all it is. But the more you study the Word of God and you learn stuff, you're like, okay, that's actually, when you gird up your loins in the Old Testament, it says, quit you like men, and it says, gird, gird up your loins like a man. It's talking about when you have to go to work. You gird up your loins to go to work, and you gird up your loins to go to war. So when this says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, or no, I'm sorry, for stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth, you learn that it's talking about 2 Timothy 
And 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When I was newly saved, I couldn't quote that verse from memory. It took a while. It took staying in the word of God every day, watching some good solid studies, doing some memory cards, flashcards. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay. And you sort of look at that and have it on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, I remember it mentioned the breastplate of righteousness elsewhere. And it's talking about being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. You put on Jesus Christ and you're supposed to represent Jesus Christ to this world. Oh, you know, and we've done studies on this, but I'm just saying I'm talking to the Lord about this. And then I... First, I start talking with them, saying, this is so great, Lord. You're teaching me what this means. This is so great. And you get excited. Oh, thank you, Lord, for showing me what this means. The next step, first step, is just reading the Bible. You really got to push just reading the Bible. The next step, you're starting to learn what it actually means. God starts showing you, either through good Bible preaching from great, from great men of God. I'm not, I'm not telling me, I'm just trying to be respectful to all the men that are actually Bible, King James Bible believers trying to preach the Word of God. But men of God that love the Lord, love His Word, and they're preaching, teaching good preaching, a uh, preaching and teaching good studies. All right? You're learning from them, okay? and from the Word. So you got this. Now you're starting to learn what it means. The final step is when you go through it the third time, or the fiftieth time. For me, the fiftieth or sixtieth time, you need to not only talk about what it means, you need to start applying it to your own life. Am I girding up my loins? with truth. Lord, have I been staying in your word? Yep. Then there's been some times where I asked, uh, I said, Lord, I don't even have to ask. I know the truth. I haven't been, I haven't been really staying in your word that much. And then the Lord's like, well, what gets in the way? Uh, lust of the flesh can get in the way. Being distracted by the world gets in the way. Getting into debates and fights and arguments with the enemy. You know, Satan and his ministers, people pretending to be Christians. And and you start going, Lord, that's no excuse. It's no excuse. I have not been studying your word lately. I haven't been studying it. I've been reading a little bit here and there, but I haven't been studying it. Mm -hmm. Having the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And you learn that's talking about uh, being a verbal witness. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness is being a living witness. That changed life, being a living witness for Jesus Christ. But then you have the uh, feet shod with the preparation of peace, the verbal witness, which we'll come back to in a second. And above all, taking the shield of faith, where, where, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And you start talking to the Lord, said, Lord, first you read it just to read it. Then you get to the point where you say, what's this talking about, the shield of faith? The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But the just shall live by faith. Faith in, in the book of uh, Hebrews, you remember, oh, in the book of Hebrews, I remember that verse that talked about what faith was. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then you said, then after reading a while, you go, I remember that story over in, in the Gospels where it talked about Thomas. And Thomas said, unless I see the scars in his hands, or put my finger in the hole in his side, I will not believe. And then when he got to do it, he, he said, My Lord and my God, to Jesus Christ. My Lord and my God. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. There's only one capital G, God the Father. And Jesus looked at him and said, Because thou hast seen, thou believeth. Blessed are they that have not seen and believe. Because that's what faith is. When you don't see and believe. When you do see and believe, it's not real, it's not real faith. Right. And you learn these things, and that's why the shield of faith is so important. Above all, taking the shield of faith. And I've talked about this before. You're like, well, you're like, Lord, I've read this a million times. Why does it say above all? And you start asking God questions in prayer. You're praying and talking to the Lord as you're going through the scriptures and starting your day with the Word of God. You're starting your day with your mind and your eyes on Jesus Christ. And by Jesus Christ, there's very few people that are doing it. Or, or there's not few, but... Sometimes we're doing great in this, and sometimes we're not doing so great in this. I've had brother come, brethren come and talk to me and saying, Hey, my, I'm having a hard time. 
and I start talking with them and I, I start learning to ask. First thing I ask is, are you starting your day with the Word of God or are you ending your day with the Word of God? And prayer. Well, no, brother, I really, I really haven't. I said, that's why life is getting so difficult. When this gets put down, I didn't say life's going to get super easy and you're not going to have any trouble at all. I said life gets overly stressful and seems to be too difficult when you put this book down. You keep this book, you keep hiding in your heart, you keep talking to the Lord about it. But above all, taking the shield of faith. You have a sword in one hand. I got my sword right here. I got my sword right here. You got a sword in one hand. <laughs> uh, and you got a shield. I haven't bought a shield yet. But you got a shield in the other. And why is the shield, shield of faith the most important? People don't tend to let go. Their, their main hand is what they usually hold the sword in. So if you're left hand, the sword's going to be in the left hand. If you're right hand, the sword's going to be in your right hand. Your main hand is what has the sword. Your off hand has the shield. And if you've ever done work, which I have, where you're holding a bunch, bunch of stuff and you want to free, free your hand up, you tend to let go or put down what's in your off hand. So you have the shield of faith and you have the sword. You take the shield of faith and you put it down so you can have a free hand. And what do you do with that free hand? You start taking off pieces of the armor of God. Once you put down that shield of faith, the rest of the armor is, short, is, is, is going to fall behind if you taking it off. That's why it's so important, above all. And you learn that. Mm -hmm. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And when you put down that shield of faith, the, the enemy comes in and starts saying, Yea, hath God said, a better rendering would be and starts messing you up on the Word of God, starts messing you up on your walk with the Lord, and how you live your life for Jesus Christ, how you, if you're a man in ministry, how you handle the ministry, it starts messing up how you handle the ministry, it starts messing you up when how you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ, it starts messing you up on how you treat the world when it comes to being a witness, that feet shod with the preparation of peace. Peace? And then you start remembering that verse over there that talks about meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Peradventure they should recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And you start remembering these verses. Uh, be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. Okay. Patient. Peace. We're supposed to preach the gospel, plant seeds, and we move on. Mm -hmm. But when you take down that shield of faith, Satan comes in, your flesh gets the better of you, because when you took down that shield of faith, left hand, Next thing you know, you find yourself putting down the sword, the Word of God. Then you're taking off the helmet of the hope of salvation. Then you start taking off the, the breastplate. You're no longer girding up your loins with truth. You kick off the shoes. You know, the, the, you start taking off all the pieces of the armor. And take the helmet of salvation. When you first read this, your first thought is, is this helmet of salvation? It's talking about when I got saved, I have a helmet now, I got saved, it's part of eternal salvation and everything. But when you start reading the Word of God, you come across somewhere else where it talks about a helmet of salvation. But only it says a helmet for a hope of salvation. Then, it starts, then you start learning every time you read that, it's not talking about it, when I got saved, eternal salvation. It's talking about temporary salvation, ta salvation in this life when God calls me home. I'm supposed to be looking that helmet for a hope of salvation. I'm supposed to be looking for that blessed hope every day with the life that I'm living. Always preparing for that judgment seat of Christ that's going to happen with the life I'm living. And you, the first time you read it, you just read it. The second time, God teaches you this and says, Hey, this is talking about looking for that blessed hope. Well, thank you, Lord. It's amazing that you taught me that. I always say one, two, three, but at some point you get to a point where you need to say, okay, now I know what it means. Now every time I come across and read it, I ask myself, am I looking for that blessed hope? Or have I taken my eyes off of it? Have I turned my back on what they call the imminent return of Jesus Christ? But what it means is, is that from Paul's day to today, every Christian was taught you're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. And there's plenty of verses for you. I'm not going to get into that. You know, if, if you disagree with me, come talk to me. All right, and I'll show you all the verses where Paul talks about how we might be redeemed. I don't know, Paul. I'm guaranteed to be redeemed. But when he says that he might redeem us, might meaning in this life, in Paul's life, in his day, he said God might redeem us. He might come back and call us home in the clouds in our lifetime. 
any day now. We're supposed to be living for Jesus Christ. You have brethren that have taken their eyes off that, off of the, that blessed hope. What happened? They put down that shield of faith. They got distracted by worldliness and lusts of the flesh, covetousness and idolatry. Right? But you start learning and you start talking to the Lord. First, it's just reading the Word of God. Then you start learning what the Word of God actually means, what you're reading. Then, over time, you get to the point where it's maintenance. You've got to keep reminding yourself what it means, and you keep evaluating your life first. I evaluate my life first. Anytime I put out Bible studies, Brother Christ, I was talking to a brother, I said, Brother, I always go through my life first. Anytime I go to teach you, Brother Says Christ, something, I hit myself up with it first. I say, Lord, am I failing you in this area? Am I doing what's right by you in this area? Am I a good example of what I'm teaching, or am I a bad example of what I'm teaching? I judge myself first, and that's what you're starting your day with. Right? The helmet for hope of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Then you remember in um, Hebrews, what talks about the, the Word of God is like a double-edged sword. And here it is, the, the sword of the Spirit, capital S Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then you talk about, then you learn about the verses that talk about Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Lord, am I doing that? Over here where it talks about gird up your loins with truth, that's studying the word of God. Here when it talks about the, taking the, word, the sword, which is the word of God, it's talking about a sword. You have to have maintenance. You've got to keep it sharp. You're supposed to be reading it every day. It's not enough just to study this. You got once you learn what it means, you got to keep maintenance. Like I said, it's maintenance. You're just maintaining the word in your own heart and in your head, so you don't forget, so you don't lose your way, falling to the right or the left. And I've seen brethren do it. Why? Because they're not maintaining that sword. They're getting too distracted by the world, the lust of the flesh, the world. The enemy's got them distracted. Right? But you start learning these other verses, and you say, oh, I remember this. Oh, I remember in Revelation, when the sword comes out of, of our Lord and Savior's mouth, when he comes back on the white horse, wipes out that 200 million man army, whew, with the word of his mouth. But it talks about a sword going out of his mouth. His word is what wipes him out. Then you start thinking, well, you know what? I also remember in the Gospels, when I think it was John, I, sometimes I get the gospel, what gospel it was, but when Jesus was in the garden and he had finished praying and he says, it's time's come, and the crowd comes to get him, he asks them, Who's, whom seeketh thou? It's his word, who thinketh, seek, seeketh thou? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And with his word, they were all knocked back and fell to the ground. Just his word. And you start remember these things. Uh, 18, uh, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Yeah. Watching. Now sometimes you think, well this is looking for the blessed hope. No, we got the helmet for hope of salvation. What is this watching here? That's what the helmet for the hope of salvation is. I've always said this before, good, the good helmets that protect you, they have a shield on the side, they have a shield on this side, and they have a, a, a piece here to protect your nose. And your eyes, you really have to turn your head to look places. And wherever you're looking is where you're going. That's why we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. If we take our eyes on Jesus Christ and look to the left, that's the direction we're going to walk. And it goes back to where you keep your eyes on the enemy, and you keep your eyes on, the on your mission, the target, where the whole goal and what's our goal? Jesus Christ, that blessed hope, the judgment seat of Christ, to go home and be with our Lord and Savior someday. So we, that helmet for hope salvation puts on, and you keep your eyes on, the, on Jesus Christ. But over here we're talking about uh, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Prayer life. Okay? Uh, pray without ceasing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that give to all men liberally and abrave not, and it shall be given to him. Let your request be made known unto God. Okay, pray without ceasing. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication to all saints. You're watching. You're watching the enemy. And you're trying to do the work of the Lord and keep the enemy at bay. While we're trying to do the work of the Lord. But it says to the saints, 
You're also supposed to keep an eye on each other and watch each other's back and warn them about the enemy. And you watch each other and you let them know, hey, you're stumbling here, brother says Christ. You're giving into the lusts of the flesh and sin. You're starting to get distracted by the world. And you exhort each other through the scriptures to get back on the right path. You're watching one another. In other words, like I said, we got, you're supposed to have each other's back. Mm -hmm. Now, verse 19, it says, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Today the gospel ain't a mystery. But in Paul's day it was because the, the gospel it's for today was revealed to Paul. And you'll start learning that, like as I did, that there are many gospels in the Bible. Okay? You have the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. That's not for us. Okay? The gospel is revealed to Paul. He says that boldness, it'd be bold. At the same time, brothers and sisters, I pray for all the brethren that you're bold in your, not just your verbal witness, but your living witness. That God gives you strength to be a good living witness, to shine for Jesus Christ, that armor of light. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And when I, when I read this, I go, okay, I know it's talking about Paul, that the gospel needs to be revealed through Paul, and... You know, but what about me, Lord? Once again, what do we get out of this? I was like, Lord, the mystery was revealed to Paul and he had to go out there. It was a new thing. But today, I pray for myself first and say, Lord, help me to be more bold and, and verbally witnessing, handing out gospel tracts. I always pray that, Lord, can I hand out a gospel tract? Instead? I leave gospel tracts everywhere, but be able to hand it to them. An opportunity opens up for me to hand a gospel tract to somebody to maybe start learning to talk about the gospel and saying it in ways that, you know, because sometimes the first few times I was out there trying to witness, I was kind of <laughs> fumbling all over myself, right? Because I didn't have a lot of scripture memorized. I had my testimony and I gave them my testimony, but I didn't have a lot of scripture memorized. Beware of those people that I'm going to preach the gospel without using any scripture whatsoever. You need to get some scripture memorized when it comes to gospel. Right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. They've all, there's none that seeketh after God. They've all together become unprofitable. There's, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. I hope that I didn't mess that one up. But there, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world work at death. And you start learning and quoting scripture, when, uh, scripture verses on the gospel that's for today. Mm -hmm. So you ask yourself, Lord, do I have boldness? Mm -hmm. Do I have boldness? Um, when we were over here talking about the helmet for hope of salvation, look for hope of salvation. Jump over to Philippians 1. This is all on the same page, but Philippians chapter 1. You get over to verse 21. It says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am a straight, in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful to you. And I'm like, let's talk about that helmet for hope of salvation. Paul's like, I'd rather go home right now and be with my Lord. Just me, you know, go home. Why am I still here? We're still here, I believe, for the judgment seat of Christ. We're trying to earn rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But we're here to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ to keep standing. People will take that and say, we also desire just to go straight home the moment we get saved. No, no, that's, Paul's been saved for a good while. He's been in the ministry for a good while. And he's at a point where it's like, you know, I, I, fit, I fought the good fight. I finished my course type attitude. He's done a lot of work for the Lord. And you know what? Getting weary from, you know, the trials and, and the, the struggle with the lost world, struggle with brethren that are falling away, you know. And there's his struggle with his own flesh. We all get tired of that, struggle against our own flesh. Remember the number one enemy? This body, this wicked body of flesh. And he's just like, I'd love to go home. Our desire is to be home with our Lord and Savior, but to be here is much more needful for you. Uh, go back up to verse 9, it says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. 
Why? That you may that you may approve things that are excellent. There's that nasty word approve again. But we're proving and being approved. So approve things that are excellent that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That blessed hope, the day of redemption. There it is again. See how it all connects? Goes back over here to the armor of God. Then you get into first Philippians, and here it is again. Till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. How you live your life before we get caught up. The day of Christ. Mm -hmm. Verse 27, jumping around, just verse 27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ. Right? Our conversation. Remember, our desire is to see people get saved. Some people with their mouth and how they talk, their desire is to see people be destroyed. Almost like they, they take some kind of pleasure in seeing people go to hell. No, no, no. So, brothers and Christ, we're supposed to keep reading and reading. You start by just forcing yourself to read. You might not get. There's still passages, brothers and Christ, Old Testament to New Testament. There's still passages that I read over and I don't understand at all. But I still read it. There's some passages in the Old Testament I still listen to, Alexander Scorvey, and you say, like, building the tent, all the different types, how they built the tabernacle. You know, that's, that's boring, that's boring. It is a little bit sometimes. But it's in here for a reason. And I want God's Word on my, fresh in my head and in my heart. There's some of the Old Testament prophecies I still am trying to piece together. I don't get it all. You know? But I still read it. We read first. Then when God teaches us what it means, we remind ourselves what it means as we're reading it constantly. And then after a while, when we're reading it constantly, God puts pricks your heart and says, Okay, now you need to be saying, how does this apply to me? How do I apply it to my life? Am I obeying what I'm reading here, or am I going against it? Remember, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study show that self approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. Does this apply to me? If it doesn't apply to me, what can I still learn from it? So I don't make the same mistake. Okay? And the last part of this video I want to do, not a very long one, but is about witnessing. Uh, in Philippians 1, verse 15, it says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some of also of good will. The one preaches Christ of contentions, not sincerity, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth. Christ is preached, and I, then do, I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now, brothers and Christ, how do you start your day? Start with the Word of God and prayer. End the day with the Word of God and prayer, and it'll get you through every day. It'll get you through every day. It does mean I'm a living witness. It works. And there's other brethren that could probably make comments in the comment section and says, it works for me too, brother. Before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. But right there we just read, we're going to get into the gospel and witnessing, giving you the, the, what I believe are the two keys today for witnessing. We read over there for us individually, for us going out and witnessing, there's different keys. One is boldness. We read over that, I'll read it again in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, no, 6. Ephesians 6, 19, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. When it comes to preaching the gospel, being a verbal witness, we need courage. Courage to stand up to people that we might look up to, that we once we get saved, we're like, they're lost as much as I am. But there's someone that, you know, that means something to you. Family members, friends, being bold to be able to stand up to them, neighbors. Okay. When you're on the street and God opens doors, hey, there's an open door. There's plenty of times where this is Christ, I didn't take the open door. There's times where I should have witnessed when I was first saved. I should have witnessed to all my family members like that. I didn't. It was done over time when God started giving me strength, giving me boldness, giving me courage. 
We had a series of studies on this channel, a courageous man or foolish man. Okay? Being bold and doing what's right and saying what's right. right. That's the key for us when we're preaching the gospel. But the key to get, what I'm realizing today, the key to get people saved today is not necessarily, we still got to preach the gospel. Please understand, I'm not saying don't preach the gospel as far as what Jesus did. We just read there, but my thing is, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I have yet to come across one person, one person that doesn't know the story of Jesus Christ. What did we just read there in Philippians chapter 1, verse 15? Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preaches Christ of contentions, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now today what's going on in the world, the, the false organized religion, is they'll take the story of Jesus Christ and they'll add to it. And they'll mess up the true plan of salvation. But everyone has heard the story of Jesus Christ. How he died. For our sins. So we're going to get into the for our sins. But just sins generally. How he died for sins generally. You know, for the sins of the world and everything. And then they talk about how he was buried and rose again the third day. Everyone's heard the story. You talk to them about Jesus Christ. You might still come across someone who's heard of a Jesus Christ and might not quite know the story. But in some way, they've already been tainted with some version, a perversion, you know, a false Christ. They might get told the real story, but then they get talked into either rejecting or accepting a false Christ. And they've never come to the true Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. So what are the two keys there? In my experience in ministry, this is what saved me, brother, says Christ. I was part of er, uh, faith alone. The false gospel of faith alone, easy believism. Some people will say free grace. Well, no. Grace, the gift is free. The gift of eternal life is free. But that grace came at a cost. It cost God the Father His Son on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. You learn that in the book of Hebrews also. Right? But I was part of that false system and that false religion, using Bible perversions. And now that false gospel and that false organized religion, uh, using Bible perversions, the false gospels have spilled over to so-called professing King James Bible believers. Okay? Two things that you're going to have to push hardcore when you're witnessing for people. And I'm speaking from experience. And some of you can say amen when you have this experience. You always got to push, number one, one thing that I was never taught and these people are not taught. And it goes back to in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Why? Because a lot of them have been brainwashed in these Bible buildings and these false religions. They've been lied to their whole life. They've been deceived and indoctrinated into lies and deception. I was. God saved me, God can save them. you got to be careful in how you present this. But you always got to come back to the fact that there is a final authority today. There is a perfect written word of God in English. It's the King James Bible. And they might not believe the King James Bible, but you always have to keep pushing that there is a final authority and God is the final authority. I've said this before, I got into, when so I was never taught the Bible version issue. Didn't even know there was a Bible version issue. A lot of them don't. They don't know about the Bible version issue. So you come across them and you set them down and you start talking to them about the Bible version issue and that there's a final authority. And somewhere along the line, you have to get into the gospel that's, that we find from Paul for today in God's perfect written word. So the first step is getting them back to a, there's a final authority and it's not you and it's not me. It's the perfect written word of God. You always got to come back, come across with that attitude, the final authority, thus saith the Lord. That's why I say when you go to preach the gospel, you need to memorize some gospel scriptures that are for today. Don't, don't fall into the trap of memorizing scripture in the, in the four gospels that's taught about the, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. But you need to be able to say, thus saith the Lord, this is the final authority. Not you, not me, this is the final authority. So that's the first key to witnessing today, because today, everybody's heard about a Jesus Christ. 
Everybody's heard some kind of gospel. All these false gospels. And the only way to get them to the true plan of salvation is you've got to get their mindset on that, they're, that God is the final authority and there's only one way to get saved today. Only one way. God's way. That's the first. Okay. Uh, the second one is you have to go into re uh, repentance. Because repentance has been utterly destroyed out there. And, and uh, I, I was always, I, they hardly ever mentioned repentance. So when repentance came up, when I was part of the easy believism, battle building, using the Bible perversions, um, when repentance came up, I was told, it's, oh, it's just going from unbelief to belief. That's it. It's just believe and believe. So it's just believe. I was lied to. Now I know better. But those people out there, brothers of Christ, they have been lied to. You want to reach them for Christ? You let them know that there is a final authority. It's the King James Bible. That God is the final authority through His perfect written word. You can even quote some verses. But that there is a final authority. They might not believe this book is, is real, but you have to be coming. It's not about them believing this book is the final authority. You have to come across that you, brothers of Christ, believe that this book is the final authority. And they're supposed to see that in us. Thus saith the Lord, not thus saith my feelings and preferences. Like when it comes back to faith alone, chapter and verse on faith alone, you can't say thus saith the Lord, faith alone, it's not there. You can't say thus saith the Lord, free grace, it's not there. Thus saith the Lord, easy believism, it's not there. If you're going to say this is the final authority and we're to submit our, and you want people that are lost to submit themselves to the final authority when it comes to the true plan of salvation, you need to learn to say, thus saith the Lord, and say it God's way, and leave it at that. Don't add to it, don't subtract from it. That, that's what I'm trying to push when it comes to authority. Getting, them to the, getting that in their head, prick their hearts, get it something that starts convicting them and eating at them that there's a final authority, and they don't have it. They could. There's times where I offer them Bibles. If you've got some extra Bibles, offer them some Bibles. King James, King James Bibles. But that there's a final authority. And then the next step, because this is what saved me, is I came to the knowledge that there's a final authority, and I came to this book believing that it's God's Word. And then, then it's like God showed me what true biblical repentance is. It's not going from unbelief to belief. It's not works where you have to clean up your life and then get saved, that's also a lie. That's a total lie. The Bible teaches repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it was repent and turn from your wickedness. The physical act of cleaning up your life came after the event in the heart. After repentance. Repentance happens in the heart. Turning from your wickedness is the outward showing that you repented in here. Repentance is not cleaning up your life and then getting saved. That's also a lie. Right. A brother in Christ showed me this verse in the Old Testament because we talk about this. True biblical repentance for godly sorrow worketh repentance towards... Uh, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow is what makes repentance work. What's godly sorrow? What godly, what's godly sorrow? Well, you flip around and say, Godly sorrow, sorrow towards God. For what? For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. I am the chiefest of sinners. O wretched man that I am. God, be merciful to me a sinner. Sorry for your personal sins that you sin against God. You don't come to the cross saying, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. You'll never get saved. You don't come to the cross and say, well, it's just the nature of man. You know, it's really your fault, Lord, because it's just the nature of man. It's just my sinful nature and everything. You'll never get saved. When you come to the cross, it's I am a sinner. O wretched man that I am. And the brother Christ showed me this. I turned to Psalms 38, verse 17. This is King David. This is a great definition, great example of what we just read um, Corinthians, about for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Godly sorrow, sorrow towards God, for what? For all of sin comes short of the glory of God, for your sins. That's leading you to hell. But uh, Psalms 38, 17 is a great, great definition of true biblical repentance. 
throughout the whole Bible. Repentance starts before you get saved, to, 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 before you get saved and God saves you, and after God saves you, that repentance is a constant thing that you're doing for the rest of your life with your walk with the Lord until He takes us home. But here's verse 17, Psalms 38, 17. For I am ready to halt, and my sorrow is continually before me. That's the conviction. The Bible says the, the uh, Holy Spirit goes out to the world to reprove the world of sin. That conviction, his sorrow is continually before me. Verse 18, for I will declare my iniquity. He didn't say give it up. He didn't say clean up his life. He says he's going to declare it. For I will declare my iniquity and I will be sorry for my sin. When you come to that cross, first you got that conviction. The Holy Spirit goes out and reproves the world of sin. You got that conviction of sin that there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with, and you find out sin. You've sinned against God, and now you're on your way to hell because you've sinned against God. And then you get told what Jesus Christ did on the cross so that you could go to heaven. And you come before the cross at Calvary. And you throw your iniquities on the foot of the cross and say, This is the wicked man that I am. Lord, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to go to hell. God be, for, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe. That's where the confession comes in. Repent. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. But brother says Christ, what I knew about what Jesus went through. I even knew about the prayer part, you know, as far as the... Uh, confessing your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But the one thing I was never taught is what true biblical repentance was. I was lied to. Brother says Christ, the world's been lied to. When you go to witness for Jesus Christ, you really got to hit on the final authority is this book. And you have to be, thus saith the Lord, when you preach the gospel, not thus saith my feelings and preferences. I'm just going to put this to the side because it's not popular. And I'm going to lower the standards down and come down to their level and try to, you'll never reach anybody for Jesus Christ that way. All you're going to do is either put them off from getting truly saved and born again, hardening their heart, or you're going to create a false convert. That's all you're going to do. So, brothers of Christ, when you go out to witness for Jesus Christ, remember these two things. We've got to push that there's a final authority, and it's not mankind. It's not the Bible perversions that promote men being the final authority. Whoever their respecter of persons, whoever their cult leader is in these Babel buildings or on YouTube or in their false religion, they're not the final authority. God, through His perfect written word, is the final authority, and that's what we've got to keep pushing. And the second thing you're going to realize is they, they've heard of Jesus Christ. They have. So what is it they haven't heard or what they've not been taught properly? What they haven't been taught is true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. It's been cut clean out or they've been lied to on what it means. And there's people today, I call them servants of Satan for a reason. There's people today that they've been rebuked publicly, they've been corrected on what true biblical repentance is, and they keep sprouting lies, and they claim they're King James Bible believers. Anybody that perverts true biblical repentance, that I just we just got definitions, God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart, and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. King David again in the Psalms. If I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. When you come to the cross and just say, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners, what you're doing is you're trying to hide your sin in your heart so you can keep it. Regarding, you know, if I regard iniquity, iniquity is another word for sin, in my heart, God will not hear me. You'll never get saved. You've got to take that sin and throw it before the foot of the cross. I didn't say clean up your life. I, we're talking spiritually. You've got to throw the, the, your personal sins that you sinned against God. When I say personal, I'm talking about your sins. Not the sins of the world. Not his sins. You don't come like that Pharisee in the publican where the Pharisee said, I thank God that I'm not as other men are. You know, or as this publican. And he goes through his works, how, he, how good he is. 
No, that, that Pharisee needed to come and fall on his knees like that publican did and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He, that publican didn't compare himself to other people. He didn't compare himself to the world by saying, we're all sinners. He didn't compare himself to the world. He came before God and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he smote on his breast. If you don't know that story, he smote himself and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That symbol of him smote self is his way of saying, I'm without excuse. Almost like what we, what we say, like we hit ourselves in the back of the head. We were stupid. We never should have done it. Whatever mistake we made, and you have that feeling about smacking somebody, you want to smack yourself upside the head. They used to smoke themselves on the breast. That's what they did. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm stupid to have ever sinned, sinned against you, Lord. And it's my fault. I did it, and I never should have done it. I'm sorry for my sins, which we just read here. You've got to push true biblical repentance. I've got a testimony over there. I haven't got the Sisters in Christ permission yet to put it out. Maybe she'll put it out herself if I can encourage her to. But I'm getting testimony where some people are coming across good ministries like this one and some other brethren in ministry preaching true biblical repentance. And they say, that was it. That's what got everything to click. That's what, how everything fell into place. I've been, I've been to different Babel buildings, hopping from one group to the next, and I knew the story of Jesus Christ. I knew what he went through and why he went through it. But something in me was like, so it's not working. What's going on? What's wrong? And when they tried to say, Lord, I need help. What's wrong? God brought them to a good channel that's preaching true biblical repentance. And they said, that's what true biblical repentance is? Having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God? And that's how you're supposed to go to the cross? Having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God? I never did that. I got caught up in the emotions. Oh, yeah, we're a sinner, you're a sinner, I'm all a And the music's playing, and I got caught up in the emotions. But I never came to him sorry for my personal sins that I've sinned against him. That's leading me to hell. And they got saved. Born again. Brother Jesus Christ, that's the key today for witnessing. You've got to get back to what the final authority is. And like I said, you have a lot of henchmen, henchmen, servants of Satan, you know, his ministers that like to transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, who say, I believe this book, but they do everything they can to, ter to tear this book apart. They do everything they can to destroy true biblical repentance. They do everything they can to take prayer out of salvation. They do everything they can, not just confessing both your repentance and your belief in prayer, but they try to take out asking God to save you. Some of the people, that might be the key. They've been like, well, I came broken, I was sorry, and, and I believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but something doesn't feel right. And you say, well, did you ask God to save you? What? I'm supposed to... I'm supposed to ask God to say, no, they just said believe, only believe. I don't have to ask. They told me I didn't have to ask. They lied to you. You want God to save you, you have to ask Him to. And we've got plenty of studies on this channel to prove it. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. People are ignorant. But the one thing I'm seeing that's leading people to Christ today, very few, we're in the last days, is final authority, what final authority is, leading up to when you tell them what the real bot, the final authority says true biblical repentance is. And it's leading people to Christ. So we're going to end this, Brother Sister Christ. How are you starting your day? Are you starting your day with the final authority and prayer? Are you ending your day with the final authority and prayer? When you go through this book, you have to force yourself to read it. And after a while, you need to, as you come across verses, very few verses where you'll come across as a babe in Christ and say, okay, I remember that one. I know what that means. But more and more verses, as you stay in the Word of God and you stay in Bible studies, more verses will stick out and you're like, I remember that one. I remember that one. Then you can start comparing them to other scriptures. I remember this other scripture kind of lines up with here, talking about this. But you've got to get to that third step where eventually not only are you forcing yourself to read just to read, but you're, you're starting to learn what they mean the passages mean what it's talking about. And then number three is you start applying it to your own heart, your own life. That's the first part of this video. I know it's going on longer than I wanted it to, but that's the first thing I want you to get, Brothers of Christ. 
The second thing is for witnessing. The key into witnessing today is final authority and what true biblical repentance is. Because I've seen lots of people, I'm one of them, that have gotten saved in the last 10 years based off of it. Everyone's heard of a gospel. Everyone's heard of a Jesus Christ. They were receiving other spirits, not the same spirit that Paul, Paul received. But we got to set them straight. And that's the best way to do it. Remember, to do it in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And you're supposed to be apt to teach. When we're instructing someone, we do it in a teaching way. Not in a tearing them down and making them feel down here and making yourself look like you're way up here. No, face-to-face -face teaching like a student and a teacher. I want you to know the truth. I want you to get saved. That kind of attitude. Not the, see, you were wrong the whole time, now get out of here type attitude, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. We're supposed to be gentle unto all men, have, be peaceful, the feet shod with the preparation of peace. And we're supposed to be patient. There's times you'll plant seeds and someone might come back later and want to hear more. You read that about Paul. A lot of times he preached the truth. At first they're like, I don't know, I don't know about this. But you know what, can we come back next week and hear some more about it? Those are the two keys to witnessing for, for Jesus Christ right, today. Back in the day, you have to teach every, you didn't have to, in the old days, if you look at the church history, in the old days, you didn't have to hit pre repentance that hard because people came broken. You don't have, they're like, you don't have to tell me I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. I am just worthless. I'm wretched. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. You didn't have to really hit repentance. But today, there's such a high uh, uh, repentance have been the, the the definition of repentance has been lied about. They've taken repentance clean out. People have go about to establish their own righteousness. People are going around being taught that they're they're the final authority on what's right and wrong. And we got to bring them back to what the final authority is on right what's right and wrong, and to the true plan of salvation, what true biblical repentance means. So, I know this wasn't hardcore scripture, but this Christ is as normal, but I just wanted to get this out. It was put on my heart. Brothers of Christ, start your day with the Word of God, end your day with the Word of God. And those three things. Read it just to read it. Then when you learn what it means, keep refreshing your mind and refreshing your heart what it means. And three, you start applying it to your life. When it applies to us, you apply it to your life. Us being the body of Christ. Okay. And then when you're going out to witness, remember these things. It's not about just telling a good how Jesus Christ died for our sins and was buried, how he died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's more about you have to go back when it says for our sins. It's talking about repentance and you've got to let them into what the final authority is and what repentance is. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for your prayers, brothers and Christ. I'm praying for you. Pray for one another and be there for one another. Stay in the book, and I'll see you in the next video.